Good morning, church. It has been absolutely wonderful for our family to be here at this church the last several months. Uh, I used to lead another church here in town, and so just to sit in a pew and to be surrounded by beautiful worship and beautiful people uh, has been such a gift. Um, but I'm realizing that I guess a pastor's got to preach. And so thank you, Pastor Kate, for inviting me. I'm truly honored. Uh, the passage I want to look at today is John 11. It's a long story, and so I would encourage you to get out the Bibles uh, that are there in your pews, because I'll be reading just seven verses or so, but referring to the rest of the story as we go along. I think this is a, a really powerful story for considering how God meets us, how God arrives and encounters us in the midst of our daily lives. You know, um, when, do, when God does that, when God encounters us, it's a, it's a wonderful thing, but it's often very unpredictable, and it's certainly uncontrollable. And I think we'll encounter all of these different elements in this text, that realizing that God is not like a genie that we can rub a lamp and we can make some wishes, and God is going to grant those wishes. Um, God arrives to make a whole new people, to make a whole new world, a new kingdom, a new economy that's bursting forth in this world. And God arrives to do that in a way that is often very surprising and disruptive, as well as comforting and joyful and transformative. In his book, The Fire Next Time, James Baldwin remarked, the Lord never seems to get there when you want him, but he's always right on time. God never seems to get there when we want him, but he's always right on time. I don't have great rhymes like manna, banana, and cabana in my sermon today, but I thought perhaps uh, we could try some call and response. So every time today I say, the Lord doesn't arrive when I want, I would love you all to say, but he's always right on time. Can we practice that? The Lord doesn't arrive when I want, but he's always right on time. Okay, good. So the story of Lazarus is in John 11. Um, it's, it's a long story. I'm going to read just the first seven verses, um, and then we'll dive in. Let's pray. Your word, Lord God, is a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. So by your grace and for your glory, may you illumine your word for us this morning. Spirit, may you speak. May you guide us into all truth so that we may become more like you, so that we may be drawn into your story, drawn into your life, and find fullness of life in you. Amen. Okay, John 11, this is the first seven verses. A man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, and so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days, and then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to him. Something a bit odd here, right? <laughs> This is maybe not what we would expect. Someone Jesus loves, very clear. He loves Martha. He loves Mary. He loves Lazarus. And he hears that Lazarus is sick, and he delays. Which the text tells us he has this knowledge that this sickness is not going to end in death. And yet, that probably wasn't landing too well with the people who were right there with the ailing Lazarus. They're probably thinking, where is Jesus? We told him Lazarus is sick. Why isn't he coming? Why isn't he arriving? What's his deal? And I wonder if, if you've ever thought that. I wonder if you've ever been in a place where you feel, 
Where is Jesus? Why isn't he arriving? Why isn't he coming? I need Jesus. And if that's where you've been, if that's where you are, if that's where you will be, I I think this story will provide much needed encouragement for you. Why? Because the Lord doesn't arrive when I want, but always right on time. Good. So verses 7 to 16 show us that uh, once again, the disciples have no idea what's going on. This is always very encouraging to me in the Gospels when the disciples, uh, huh, what, what? And, and Jesus has to spell it out for them, make it very clear. It's very encouraging to me as a thick-headed disciple to know that I'm not alone in these moments. So Jesus says, Lazarus is dead. And we should go to Judea because what you're about to encounter, you could not imagine. It's going to blow your minds. Jesus is trying to teach them prior to arriving back in Bethany that his delays are not his denials. God's delays are not God's denials. They're an opportunity, if we're open to it, to experience the miracle of God's grace, the miracle of new creation, the miracle of surprise. And the best and most beautiful things we'll see come to those who wait, even in the waiting can bring us through the valley of the shadow of death. Good things come to those who wait. Because the Lord doesn't arrive when I want, but he's always right on time. So Jesus and his disciples, they head to Bethany. This is verses 17 to 36. If you're following along in your Bibles, here Jesus is going to encounter Martha first and then Mary. So Jesus arrives. Lazarus has already been dead four days. It's an important detail in the text. Because in Jewish tradition, after three days, the body is fully dead. The soul has departed to be with God. So the fourth day, this is a fully dead Lazarus. So this is not like Miracle Max in The Princess Bride, who thinks that maybe, perhaps, Wesley is just mostly dead. Uh, Anyone fan of The Princess Bride? Okay, so you're tracking with me. So this is not a situation where you can press on Lazarus' chest, and he will say, Twelve. He is fully dead. And it's an important part of the story, because it's going to set us up for for the miracle, for the surprise of, of new creation. So he's totally dead, which means his family, his friends, they're in deep mourning, deep grief, And Martha comes out to meet Jesus, learning he's approaching. Martha comes out first, and and she's hopeful. Jesus says, your brother will rise again. Martha responds, I know. Yes, I know. I have that hope too. But the thing about Martha's hope is that she is thinking about the resurrection in the last day, the end of the age. She, She doesn't have in mind some resurrection miracle in the present. And this possibility that Lazarus could come back to them right then and right there. So in in responding to her, Jesus both affirms her hope and he he challenges, he intensifies that hope, pointing out this unbelievable fact that he is the resurrection and the life. Right here and right now. Jesus doesn't respond to Martha by saying, I will make a resurrection happen sometime in the future. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will never die. And then he asks Martha, this is verse 26, the same question he wants us to consider today. Do you believe it? You see that question in the text? Do you believe it? Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, not just for some future life, some future time, but right now, for this moment, for this day, for whatever situation you are in, do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that Jesus can raise you to new life after the death of a marriage? Do you believe that Jesus can raise you to new life after the death of a career? Do you believe that Jesus can raise you to new life after the death of old certainties? Do you believe that Jesus can raise you to new life after the death of a family member? Perhaps the death of a child? 
Do you believe that Jesus can raise the church to new life out of the death of old prejudices, out of the death of old privileges? And this isn't about a, some sort of prosperity gospel that when you believe in Jesus, all will go well, you'll be raised into money and happiness and all the things. No, it's when you believe in Jesus, God creates a new thing. God is about a new creation, newness within the old, newness within despair, newness within death, whatever that death looks like in your life, that Jesus is breaking into our lives, our messed up lives, messed up systems, our messed up world, and he's bringing newness out of it. He is remaking us. He's remaking the whole world. And this process can be glorious we celebrate that in Easter tide, the resurrection of Jesus and its ongoing effects in the world is glorious. But also, if it's an entirely new thing, we should expect it to be painful. Right. We should expect it to be uncomfortable. The, the writer C.S. Lewis once described this process of coming to new life in Christ as God is not arriving to, to make some little tinkers in your, the house of your life. He's not sprucing it up a little, putting up new curtains, you know, maybe a new paint job. And when God arrives in our life to do something new, to do resurrection things, he is blowing out walls and he is lifting the roof and he is adding a new wing and he's making a new house, a new life. And if you're living in that house, it can feel like, um, God? <laughs> I didn't want that new wing. The house is fine the way it was for me. I kind of like that color. But God is doing this new thing. So it can feel disruptive, but it's the, it's the best kind of disruption because God always knows better. And the Lord doesn't arrive when I want, right. but he's always right on time. He's always right on time. Martha encounters that. Then Mary. Mary runs out to Jesus, and she is deep in grief. So Martha, hopeful. Mary, she's lost. She's lost. And, and she unleashes her objection. Lord, you should have been here. You should have been here. If you had been here, my brother would still be alive. How dare you, Jesus? And Jesus doesn't chide her. This is an amazing moment. Look at verses 34, 35, if you're following along. He's, he's not explaining this away. He's not making her, her feel dumb. How does Jesus respond? How does Jesus respond? He weeps. Yeah, Jesus wept. One of the most poignant, the shortest verse in the Bible, because we're meant to pause, just consider how amazing this is, that this Jesus, who is God in the flesh, this Jesus who knows what's coming, he weeps. He is moved in his full humanness by this grief and, and the horror of the situation. Yes, he should have been there. He should have been there. And the author of Hebrews says that Jesus was fully human in every way so that he might be our faithful high priest, so that he might be our mediator. So he knows what our life is like and he can take all of that to God. He experienced all of it so that he can be our representative. And the one here who is, is the resurrection and the life, which he had just says, he is experiencing the horror and the grief of death, even before his own death. He knows what it's like to be weak. He knows what it's like to be frail. He knows what it's like uh, to feel all of these things. And, and that's incredibly good news. Jesus meets Mary in her grief. And that's good news for us who are carrying grief. Because like Mary, you might be angry with God in that. You might be thinking, hey, God, if you're God, you can fix this. If you're God, you can sort out this messy situation. But, but I think what we see here, that there's, there's better news. That um, if, like Mary, we're meeting God in our grief, we know that God is fully with us in it. Amen. And that is better than fixing it. Because God will be with us in our grief, God will be with us in our celebrations, God will be with us in our joy, God will be with us in the mundane. God affirms it, shares it, uh, despite all of the objections, by the way, the onlookers who are saying, oh, look, the miracle man failed. He's, he's still right there in it. And there's a mystery here. You know, sometimes God heals, 
Um, Sometimes God restores and preserves, but often God meets us in our grief, meets us in our pain, meets us in our suffering without any promise or expectation of a miracle on the near horizon. But even that, that God is with us in all of that, this is incredibly good news. He knows our grief and he assures us of his promises and he reminds us that the Lord doesn't arrive when we want, but he's always right on time. Okay, let's look at the resolution. Verses 38 to 44, Jesus arrives at the place where Lazarus has been buried and he says, take away the stone. And Martha goes, um, Jesus, it's going to stink. You know, if we roll away the stone, it's going to stink. Wait, Martha, Jesus is just saying he's going to roll the stone away and raise Lazarus. And you're concerned about the stench? Uh, okay, I see myself here very much. That I, I have all of these petty concerns. I'm irritated by this and I'm annoyed by that. And, um, and I can so easily miss how God wants to encounter me in the midst of just the ordinariness of my petty concerns in life. You know, and often that's through other people. Like when I arrive home after a a hard day at work and I come in and here are beautiful smiling faces ready to greet me and I'm like, pick up your backpack, put your shoes away. You know, what is this? And I I missed it. I miss how God wants to encounter me through the love of my children, you know, because of my petty concerns. <laughs> Don't roll the stone away. It's going to stink. Yeah. Um, we, we can easily miss the big things God is doing when we're, when we're just too focused on our own comfort, our own preferences, wh- whatever it might be. My lack of receptivity, my willingness to be surprised. I can feel a lot like Martha, and I need to remember The Lord does not arrive when I want, but he's always right on time. And even though Jesus is powerful enough just to say, Lazarus, come out. The text says that he musters up the loudest voice. I won't do it because of the microphone. But Jesus bellows out from the depth of his being, Lazarus, come out. And I think in that way of saying, he's saying enough of half-hearted hope, enough of grief, enough of petty concerns, resurrection life needs to happen now. I'm sick of it. (laughs) It's time to give a little preview of why I came. It's time to give a little preview of what my mission is all about. New creation, new life, resurrection. And here comes Lazarus. A stumbling mummy, you know, he's all wrapped up. And, and my son, Chalmer, loves this because he's just studied Egypt in kindergarten. And he's like, there's a real live walking mummy in the Bible. <laughs> and um, we had a conversation about, yeah, the Bible is not boring. I mean, the Bible is anything but boring because, yes, we have a live walking mummy. And I mean, put, your, put yourself in his place just for a second. What is Lazarus feeling? Especially before they take his, uh, those, those cloths off. I mean, it, is he happy? Um, does he want to be brought back into this life? I think he's probably wondering what in the world is going on. I thought I was dead. And I was experiencing the presence of God. Maybe he was a little disappointed. Uh, I discovered this poem by Brett Foster. It's called The First Request of Lazarus. He writes in this poem, how does one return happily to work again the olive groves? How to age now? How not to become weary with second living? And I think there's some truth to that. Lazarus too is wondering what in the world is going on? How do I do this life again, having passed through death into the presence of God only to meet Jesus again in this old life? But the Lord doesn't arrive when we want what is always right on time. And for everyone who loves Lazarus, of course, this is this is a festive moment. This is a glorious moment and it's a decisive one. So after that resolution, Lazarus walking out of of the tomb, 
you have this uh, really clear reaction of either belief or conceiving how to kill Jesus. You see when, when new creation breaks into the world, th- there isn't middle ground. Like Jesus obliterates middle ground. There's no middle ground in this new creation life. You receive it, you start to live in it, or, or it's everything that is foreign to you and you want to reject it. So those who plotted to kill Jesus were just thinking about maintaining their power structures. You know, like, wait, if this really happened, then this is going to start a movement. Romans are not going to be happy. The Romans are going to sweep in and they are going to they're going to resist us. They're going to take us off our comfortable thrones of power. They are going to upset this whole situation we have going on of earning lots of money and maintaining our power. And this is really this reaction at the end of John 11. It is a warning to any of us who are too invested in privilege, who are too invested in positions and too fearful of of powers that can bring new life, that if we are too invested in these things and not enough uh, open to to the, the new life that God is bringing, then we will miss it. We will miss it. And the church has missed it over and over again throughout the years. So um, this is a warning to us individually. This is a warning to us as, as the big C church. Let's not miss it. Let's receive it. Even if it's going to blow out those walls and lift the roof and the paint color is not going to be what we like. There's people around that are going to make us uncomfortable. This is it. This is the invitation. And those who believed knew that there was no other way of reading this sign. This was the sign that Jesus really is the resurrection and the life. I mean, who would want to maintain their old power, their old positions in in the face of this kind of new creation? Who would want to cling to their own identity when you can find such an incredible new identity that will bring fullness of life now and forever? But let's not kid ourselves. This happens in the midst of half-hearted hope, grief, petty concerns, daily life, like this is happening now. This is the story of our lives, that God in Christ by the Spirit is inviting us into new creation, inviting us into resurrection life, and it can be disruptive, and it can be incredibly good news. So those who have ears to hear and a willingness to respond, Spirit, may you make it so, because the Lord does not arrive when we want. When does he arrive, church? He arrives always at the right time.